recorder yet. Thankfully, I remembered that. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Okay. Am I, is my volume, is it good? Yeah, it's good. I can hear it just fine. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you for choosing to fly Acme Airlines. In the flight deck today, we have Captain Jeff, First Officer Miami Rick, and in the jump seat is Dr. Steph. Please enjoy your seat belt are on. Your seats, pink levels, and window shades are all up. Most importantly, your electronic devices are powered on. We're about to push back, so sit back and enjoy Acme Airlines. Airline Pilot Guy, Episode 175. Hello, you're listening to the Airline Pilot Guy Show, the view from my side of the cockpit door. I'm Captain Jeff, your host, broadcasting live from Studio 1B in the APG headquarters building in Roswell, Georgia. In this episode, a Bonanza crashes in Massachusetts, killing three aboard. Uh, the Solar Impulse breaks several records, completing Japan to Hawaii flight. Another fool in a lawn chair hoisted by helium balloons and dangerous public safety. And more news and feedback. So get all settled in. Tray tables and seat backs in their upright and locked positions. Electronic devices powered on. Flight 175 is ready for pushback. Hello once again to the Airline Pilot Guy show. And uh, if you're watching the video, we're doing a live hangout. And uh, joining me on uh, the uh, part one of uh, episode 175 is my co-pilot, Dr. Steph in Charlotte. Hi, everyone. Good to be back again. And yes, part one. Yes. For tonight, at least. So we always try to coordinate our schedules to try to get together to, you know, do this as a, a co-hosted kind of a, you know, team event. And uh, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And uh, uh, Rick... Uh, Miami Rick was flying back from South America today, and uh, he just arrived uh, about, a, what, an hour and a half ago or so? Yeah, like 7.30-ish, I think. Yeah, flying all day long back from South America, and uh, then they didn't have a gate when they got in, and uh, he was flying as a passenger. And then uh, I guess the, he was uh, tasked with uh, fixing a flat tire for his dear wife. I'm assuming that's who the boss is. And, uh, well, there was a picture of the boss on, uh, Twitter for those who follow the other day. So oh, she didn't... wanted to make herself known, I believe. So, oh, okay. I don't, um, I don't remember seeing that. I'll have to know if I'm supposed to share that or not, but check that out <laughs> yeah. myself. Uh, but anyway, uh, so we decided we would do this, uh, yeah. it's kind of late at night and, uh, we are, um, uh, recording the news and intro portion of the show tonight. And then tomorrow, Rick and I will uh, continue with the uh, feedback, and it seems like half of it's for him anyway. So it's all for him. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, anyway, we'll uh, we'll just keep on pressing on with the mm. intro and news, and uh, yeah. So let's see. Um, mugs and pint glasses. I was able to get out several of them this week. Not all of them. So many of you are still waiting for them to arrive and, um, but I'm, I'm making, you know, slow, but positive progress with that. So hang in well, there. That's and if you right. haven't gotten them yet and you you're waiting for them, I'll tell you, they're really awesome. I got a box in the mail today. So thank you very much, Jeff. Oh yeah, sure. Oh, by the way, cool. I didn't tell you that hat. Yes. I was going to ask about the hat. Okay. So, uh, I got this, um, uh, by the way, my new address, um, I used to say, you know, tell everybody, you know, mail things to my, my actual home address, but uh, I decided it was probably better to have a P.O. box. And so I got a new P.O. box and I went and checked it the other day and I had a package. I'm not sure exactly how Tony knew to send it to my P.O. box because I really didn't tell anybody I had a P.O. box. But anyway, <laughs> um, and uh, so I, Terry, um, where, where did you go here? Terry, Tony, I'm sorry, Tony Fletcher sent me this, this box and I opened it up and it had 
three hats, three, and I meant to get mine. Uh, do you have yours? Not anywhere nearby. It's okay, well, downstairs I'll and around the corner. And I'll get. I tell you what, just keep stay tuned. I'll have it tomorrow morning when I do the uh, the uh, the feedback part two. Of the show. And uh, so anyway, he sent three of those. So I'm assuming that uh, Tony uh, and his son uh, intended to send them to the three of us, right? Because it doesn't make sense for me to have three baseball caps. Uh, although he didn't specifically state that that's what the three caps were for. But uh, well, assuming that's what that's for, thank you very much, Tony. It's very cool. I wear baseball hats all the time when driving my car. I need something to contain my hair and keep the sun off my face. So. Yeah, they're very nice. They're uh, yeah. khaki colored and they have uh, the letters. Uh, and again, I'll show them tomorrow. Uh, VKX, and that's for Potomac Air Park or Potomac Airfield or Airport. or Potomac different. something. It's a, yeah. Yeah, and it's it's very interesting. I'll put a link in the show notes if I remember uh, information about. I, I went, looked it up on uh, Wikipedia, and it's uh, one of I think three airports that are within this um, flying security zone or something like that. Right. In the yeah. Washington D.C. area. It's like between Andrews and um, and Washington D.C. You know, the mall and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, so anyway, it's a very special airport, and uh, they. Um, and they have these very cool hats. So uh, Tony wrote in his letter that uh, he saw he and his son were at um, the National Air and Space Museum, and uh, they missed us. And they, they flew their airplane in, and uh, so they were out there. We probably passed yeah, right we, by them when we were walking around outside. Yeah, we were out there for a little while, so we probably did walk right past them. Yeah, so we're sorry that we missed you, Tony, and uh, missed your son as well. And uh, thank you so much for sending those uh, nice baseball caps. And uh, again, I will uh, wear them on part. I'll wear mine on part two, so you can all see the, what they look like. Um, and uh, so anyway, uh, the mug and pint glasses, get, getting those knocked out. And I'm going to have to come up with a better system. I think like uh, some kind of a store on the website, and maybe get somebody to volunteer to handle all that for me because it takes a lot of my time that I really don't have. <laughs> so, um, anywho, uh, let's see, I uh, just listened to, I listened to all kinds of aviation shows and technology shows and Catholic shows and, you know, way too many podcasts, uh, uh more podcasts than I have time to listen to. Uh, but one of the ones that I listened to while I was riding my bike, by the way, I'm, you'll be happy with me. Uh -huh. stuff. I'm out riding my bike in my neighborhood and Yay. riding, mm -hmm. you know, i you know, about 10 miles or so and um, you know, getting back into that. And uh, so I'm listening to podcasts while I'm doing that. And I listened to the latest episode of the plane safety podcast. Pilot Pip had an interview with captain Al. Now captain Al also sends in uh, feedback to this show. So it was a very interesting and entertaining conversation. So you should check out plane safety podcast episode 15 with captain Al. And of course, that Pip guy. <laughs> and, uh, so we don't know who he is. But. Yeah, I don't know uh, exactly what that stands for. I guess. Oh, you know, I learned something today, listening to the show. That uh, I guess Pip is kind of a short name for Philip. I never knew that. It makes sense, though. Yeah, it yeah. does. Now that I think about it. All right, and uh, let's see. I can't think of anything else before we get on to the coffee fund. Can you? Um. No. Okay. Go for the coffee fund. All right. The Ink Spots. Recorded in 1940. The Java Jive. Johnny, how much more coffee? No thanks. Coffee. I love tea. I love the Java Jive and it loves me. Come on, everybody listening. Sing along with me. Stephanie, you don't I'm, have to because there will yeah. probably be some latency in there and it probably won't sound right. No, I'll, I'll just... Refrain from singing as is my usual custom. <laughs> okay. So the uh, coffee fund is your way to support the show. Now this show is free. It's a labor of love and uh, we're all volunteers here, but we do have some costs associated with uh, the production of the show, like uh, hosting and media server costs and uh, uh, equipment costs, etc. cetera. And uh, if you want to help out, if you have the means to do so, you can head over to AirlinePilotGuy.com slash coffee and contribute to the coffee fund. A couple different ways to do that. One is what I call the classic method, PayPal. And uh, since the last show, three people um, 
let's see, Jeff Moeller, he, uh, he and his wife, Anissa, uh, do a recurring payment kind of thing. So thank you again, Jeff and Anissa. Uh, Frank Malott in uh, Europe and Jeffrey McFeeters. I'm not sure where Jeffrey's from. Uh, were three that were uh, contributors to the uh, Coffee Fund Classic. And since the last show, another way to do this is via Patreon. You can become a patron of the Airline Pilot Guy show. And since the last show, no new patrons. But I got a bunch of them there that are supporting the show each and every time I put out an episode. So I do appreciate it every time. That you, Thanks, everyone. Yeah. All right. So that's enough of that. Let me make sure there's nothing else here below the fold. No, nope, I don't see anything else. So that means that it's time to get on with the news. Well, we'll start off with some sad news. A Beechcraft Bonanza A36, November 5626 Delta, uh, was flying from Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, aboard were Dr. Joseph Callister, his wife, Betty, and their daughter, Nicole. They were heading up to uh, Massachusetts to visit Northeastern University in Boston, where Nicole was enrolled as a freshman. Unfortunately, they had some engine problems and they crashed and all three of them perished in the, in the crash. Hmm. I have a little bit of um, uh, audio if you want to listen to that. Hey, good evening. Bonanza 5626 six Delta out of 5 to 3. Bonanza 5626 six Delta, Boss French, good evening. The Norwood Altimeter, Channel 6 Atlantic. Would you prefer the localizer or the GPS French today? GPS 23, please, sir. Okay. Uh, so, you know, Nothing, everything is going along swimmingly, of course. The Sounds way. pretty routine. Yeah. 26 Delta, flying is 090, vectors to the RNF GPS runway 35 approach, mm. Venus Gulf current. 090, got Gulf, down 3000, 26 Delta. For 26 Delta, turn right hitting a 100, and descend to maintain 2000. 100, 26 Delta. And this is 5626 Delta, is there an emergency at this time? For 26 Delta, Roger, and uh, say, uh, pay attention. We uh, still wanted to do the three uh, uh, approach to three five, but we have engine problems. Number two six Delta, very good. And when you're able, just advise the souls on board and fuel remaining, and what the exactly the emergency is, if you know what the engine problems are. Well, it looks like our uh, our uh, uh, we've lost our control panel. Six Delta, just say again what the uh, intentions of the issue are is with the engine. Yeah, we've got problems with the engine. This is the nearest airport. The nearest airport is on North Central, just behind you, about uh, seven miles or so. Can you direct me there? And I need I need vectors. I can't do it. I can't shoot anything. Two six Delta, very good. There's an RNF approach that uh, is inbound from the north. And you're clear to North Central Airport via radar vectors. So it's hitting three five zero, maintains three thousand. Three five zero two six Delta. Okay. You know what? I'm not going to play any more of that because it's depressing. Um, they, um, basically, uh, the Bonanza is a single engine airplane, and uh, they um, lost engine power and they're mm -hmm. thinking that uh, the uh, this airplane in this uh, the time frame it was made and the engine that uh, was likely uh, in the airplane or used in that aircraft uh, was part of the same family of engines that uh, suffered a series of crankshaft failures in 1999 there was an emergency airworthiness directive uh, out put out to uh, ensure that uh, Airplanes powered by the Continental IO 550 engine, uh, a 280 horsepower six cylinder power plant, uh, an inspection of that because um, I guess there were some problems with the, uh, what is it, the crankshaft journal or something like that? Yeah, it said um, crankshaft connecting rod or fracture. Okay. So some sort of yeah. metal defect. Yeah, and I think that uh, the an investigator from the National Transportation Safety Board probing the wreckage of uh, the crash on Sunday reported finding a hole in the crankcase of the engine. So it does sound like um, this might have been the cause of this engine failure. Now, it was in a bad situation. Only one engine, your mm -hmm. one engine's going out. Uh, they are not 
in the clear. They are in right. IMC instrument mm -hmm. meteorological conditions. And um, yeah, and you could tell just from that last bit of the, uh, of the, uh, the, uh, the recording. recording. Yeah. Thank you. That, uh, that there was a lot of vibration there. You could just tell it uh, the way he was talking that he was having trouble uh, maintaining right. control of the airplane and uh, the airplane ended up crashing into, uh, into a, a house. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and there were, there were some people in the home and some pets in the home. Where is this? I had that. It's up at the top. It said four occupants of the dwelling, uh, Aaron Rice, his wife, Carol, their two sons and family pets managed to escape unharmed. So, yeah. So that was a good news. Yeah. And, uh, there were some here, let me see if I can, uh, show you the uh, picture of the house if you're watching the video and of course that would require me to go over here like this and do some screen sharing and uh, I promise i'll get better at this as time goes on <laughs> so that is a picture of the uh, of the home oh, wow. that, um, was engulfed in flames and uh, luckily all the uh, inhabitants of the house uh, were able to get out uh, without harm. So anyway, yeah, um, scary stuff. <laughs> yeah. They're investigating that. And, uh, the air traffic controller, uh, very calmly, you know, started directing them and vectoring them over toward a, uh, a highway a 495 and hoping that they'd be able to break out and then see the highway and land on it. Land, and, yeah. yeah. It didn't say what the, uh, weather was, did it? What the overcast? No, I, I was. looked at it, um, when I was originally adding this to the uh, list of news and uh, I think it, I, I don't quote me, I'm not, I'm not sure about this, but I think it was about 1200 foot ceiling. So yeah. I think there were about 6,000 feet to begin with and they were descending to about 3,000. 3,000, yeah. Could not maintain altitude. Obviously, if you don't have a working power plant, it's going to be difficult to maintain altitude without losing airspeed and lift. Yeah. So... Anyway, our uh, thoughts and prayers go out to this uh, nice-looking family from Knoxville, Tennessee, and uh, their family and friends. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's a kind of a tragedy. Um, so let's let's look at something that's a little bit more light, and uh, that would be this. Um, well, let's take a listen here. It's an airplane here that. Uh, a little girl in the back seat. Her name is Leah. On y va doucement. And uh, she accélère. has an infectious laugh. On tire. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Là, on va y aller en tire. On, on y va en tire. You got to watch the uh, video if you're listening to the audio podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so they're doing uh they're doing loops and aileron rolls and barrel rolls and she's in the back seat of this thing just uh just giggling and smiling and having yeah, a... she's she's having the time of her life there that's great <laughs> really anyway so i'll have a i'll have a link to that in the show notes if you want to check it out and, uh, you really need to because it's uh it's uh very adorable <laughs> i love that um, yeah, that's great. All right. Um, so now that we're now that we're happy, let's uh, turn you around to. Well, this is not really too bad. Um, I, well, it's not. I wouldn't call it uh, sad. <laughs> I'd call it. Um, I don't know. Maybe just a good example of what not to do. So yeah, okay. maybe use your brains a little bit and um, <laughs> so have a little common sense. This is from uh, the Aviation Herald, and uh, it was a uh, in Rarotonga, which I think is one of the Fijian Islands, right? Fuji Cook Islands. Cook Islands. Okay, thank you. Rarotonga, uh, Air New Zealand, an Air New Zealand uh, Boeing seven 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 two hundred um, was uh, taking off on June twenty fifth. And uh, apparently there's like a, you know, like a lot of these island airports or, yeah, they don't have, you know, they have a runway and uh, they have like a turnaround area at the very end of it. And uh, in the article, it has an overhead view uh, from Google Maps of the uh, little turnaround area. And then there's like a road very, very close to the end of the, uh, mm -hmm. 
uh, whatever what would you call that the uh, the run up area yeah. and uh, there's also um, a video that I had uh, uh, that I looked up it was not this incident incident but it was one like it where people were out there watching uh, this triple seven uh, do its thing and uh, apparently some people um, got blown over and uh, I guess uh, slightly injured from well, I said they were in the hospital for a week. Well, yeah, it was more than slightly injured. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, three people watching the 777 depart from the public road were blown away. They were blown away, <laughs> <laughs> literally, by the jet blast and received in, received injuries. An ab- ambulance picked the three picked up the three plane spotters, took them to the hospital, and uh, so. No problem with the people on board the airplane, of course. No, they were <laughs> they fine. safely in Auckland on June 26th, about four and a half hours later. So uh, the moral to the story is any of these places, like that place in St. Martin and... Yeah, Princess Juliana. Yeah. The airport, yeah. You know, high velocity jet engine exhaust, you know, it is, is dangerous. Right. Yeah. So don't be an idiot. <laughs> That's our public service announcement. Don't be an idiot. Think about it. The more you know. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then here's some more good news. I'm trying to, you know, balance these all out. Give you uh, lighthearted news, perhaps. Yes. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Were you watching this live, Stephanie, or when it was happening uh, just a few days ago on July 3rd? Well, wait a minute. No. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was right well, before. The last, the last time we recorded a show, you had the link, link to it up and... Uh, I was over there watching it and they were, I forget how many miles away from Hawaii at that point, but um, yeah, that's they right. were getting close. I yeah. didn't see it live as it, as they actually got there, but well, solar impulse two. Um, and it was on July 3rd. I think that was the day that we uh, actually recorded the uh, last show and I neglected to mention anything about this. <laughs> right. Well, you had it up <laughs> and yeah. then we didn't talk about it at all. Yeah. Which is weird. Um, that's just, you know, that's me and my little quirks. But know. it's more, you know, probably better to talk about it after they actually arrived safely and all of that. So. But many of us, um, I, you know, I was, I was on Twitter and a bunch of people in the uh, aviation world, aviation geek world, were uh, tuning in live and watching the live broadcast of the event as uh, Solar Impulse 2, uh, piloted by Andre Borschberg, landed safely in Kaliloa, Kalea, Kalea Loa. Is that right? Kalea Loa? Uh, you know, That's sure. Right. Uh, <laughs> a, a place in Hawaii um, on uh, Oahu, I believe, on uh, July 3rd at 5.55 in the morning, local time. And uh, they were uh, en route for just four, or they, he was en route for four days, 21 hours, and 52 minutes. I think, didn't they log 117 hours of flight time? Yes. Yeah. Yes. There was a picture of the, uh, the log book. It said 117 hours. Just for one flight. For one flight, yeah. Not a lot of people can claim that mm, no. in log books. Or if they do, they're lying. Yes, so, they're, or they're in India. Yeah, I think, let's see. <laughs> uh, the distance, yeah. <laughs> With an airplane that has no engines. Exactly, exactly. Um, now, this airplane does have engines, four of them, but they're electric. And this thing was entirely uh, powered by the sun and batteries that were charged by the sun. And uh, it was, it's an interesting uh, thing that they're proving here. They're doing this around the world flight. And this is, I think, uh, leg number eight of 13, I believe. Uh, the next leg will, next segment will take them from Hawaii to somewhere in the Southwest, uh, mm-hmm. maybe California or Arizona. I can't remember now. Gotcha. But uh, this, this particular flight, the distance was 7,212 kilometers uh, the maximum altitude was 8,634 meters, which I think is somewhere around 30, 31,000 feet. And uh, their average ground speed was 61.19 kilometers per hour, which I think is about 25 knots or so, yeah. or 25 miles per hour, something like that. Anyway, uh, you know, obviously we're not there yet with solar powered jetliners carrying passengers all around the world at jet speeds, but uh, we're making progress. But if you're one person who would like to travel um, leisurely yeah. from point A to point B and, um, you know, in a green fashion, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, we're going green. 
We're going green. We're going to take care of the earth. We're going green. It took us 24 minutes. Wow. To, uh, it's because Rick's not here. <laughs> Rick would have had it. <laughs> he would have mentioned something within the first like three minutes. Perhaps. To play this perhaps. <laughs> but I'm sure that won't be the first or the only time we play no. that. One. I guarantee it won't be. <laughs> no. So uh, anyway, congratulations uh, go to the uh, the the pilot and uh, the whole crew, uh, a very large support crew of people working on the Solar Impulse project. If you want to follow their adventure, their monumental historical uh, adventure, um, look for the link in the show notes and follow along with all the rest of us. It's very cool. Um, oh, let's see what's going on here. Do you hear that? Ooh. Ooh. Sounds like that a sounds phone. angry. Bees, angry, angry bees were swarming a uh, attacking a passenger plane in Moscow. Uh, thousands of bees staged an extraordinary attack on a passenger plane at a Moscow airport. They swarmed an Airbus 319 as it was about to start taxiing ahead of taking off from Vanukovo Airport bound for St. Petersburg. The bees flew under a wing, said eyewitnesses reporting the incident. Some attached themselves to the wing, while others covered windows of the Ro Rosia Airlines plane. I'm not sure how yeah. you pronounce that. But. Sounds good to me. They must have a big giant bee or something. I don't know. Um, two ambulances were called to the plane amid fears that the bees might get inside the cabin. Stings from bees can cause anaphylactic shock in people with an allergy, and honeybee yep. stings release a pheromone. 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 Thank you. Mm -hmm. I should talk. I should let the uh, doctor talk. <laughs> which part? That's okay. Just keep going. You're fine. Nearby bees to attack. So, I guess these were. Uh, I think I read somewhere that they were killer bees. Well, so there's the. They were talking about Africanized honeybees as well. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if these were. I don't think they said if they were or not, but yeah, I don't know if they have those in Russia, but we have them here in the southern U.S. or southwest U.S., So, but they're more aggressive apparently. So, Yeah, apparently so. Apparently so. Um, yeah, so we have that. Last October, a swarm of angry bees attacked a drone as it flew over Miami Beach in Florida. I don't remember that. No. Quadcopter, quad, quadcopter fitted with a camera had been launched to capture a stunning aerial view of the coastal resort city, but as soon as it soared above the surrounding trees and homes, it was attacked by a large swarm of male honey bees. Those males. I know. What are you going to do? Sorry, stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know? Yeah. I I'll, I'll just keep my comments to myself. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, I was going to say, I bet that was pretty interesting video if they actually were able to... Uh, yeah, I don't remember like seeing that. Yeah, we'll have to look maybe for it. Uh, maybe the UAV digest. Um, are you hearing that notification sound every time I get a, a tweet? Um, I, I, I was it, wondering if you're hearing mine. Well, maybe um, that's what I'm hearing because are it's, you hearing it's it buzz because it's yeah, yeah. The sound on my phone off, but it's still oh, it's right here. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I think it's it's uh, coincident with Sorry. some of the notifications that I'm getting as well. So they're all from Hello, Miami Rick on Twitter. <laughs> Hello, everybody out there watching us live. Steph and I are waving at you right now. If you're Hello. the audio, just picture us waving. By the way, I'm. Uh, you may have noticed I'm in oh. Studio One B, which is a different part of my basement. I was telling Steph that uh, you know during the daytime, the windows behind me, kind of like a bay window area, um, are show really pretty views of uh, the backyard with all the greenery. The green. Did I say green? You, you did. Going green. Yeah, the We're green behind green. me. Now, I, I want you to know, I, I know it sounds like I'm making fun of people that are, you know, are, are thinking about the earth and, and uh, taking care of it and all that kind of stuff. And I, I believe in that as well. I'm not, uh, I'm not making fun of that. I'm just having fun with that song. I love this song. And I, I, think, it's, I think it's important that we uh, do find alternative sources of fuel to uh, help us keep the planet green in the future. Exactly. That's my statement, and I'm sticking with it. Um, I was just looking over at the, uh, if you go over to the YouTube comments, there are people watching and oh, commenting. 
I should do that. I was um, neglecting I have, it until just now. So. I, I only have a little bit of screen real estate myself. And so let me, uh, let me take the time out right now to look and see what's happening. Oh, look at that. Yeah, many people are, are there in the chat room. Um, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, they're talking about the new camera placement. Well, this is a different room in my basement. And I just talked about that, so never mind. It'll be redundant for me to mention anything about it now. So I think we should keep on moving because those yes. people that are not watching the video, the people who are listening to the audio, oh gosh, this most is of you are just... probably pulling their hair out right now. <laughs> stop it. <laughs> okay. We're going to stop it. Uh, let's move on with uh, a mid-air collision. Mm. And i um, still not sure. Have we heard anything more about this F-16 that uh, collided with a Cessna 150? You know, I, ha I mean, it's been, been all over the, I'm sure it's been all over the national news too, but very much all, all over the uh, local news here because um, we're not that far from, from where this happened. Um, but all I know is basically what this article says. So I don't know if they know anything more about it. Um, yeah, I guess a small, my... small plane collided with in midair with a, I would say the F-16 collided with the C1 Cessna 150 and not the other way around because these, the F-16 was probably flying a heck of a lot faster. Right. And uh, unfortunately, the two occupants of the Cessna 150 were killed. Uh, well, and I, I don't know if this has been updated or not, but the, from either yesterday or the day before, they found, I think it was a, um, a father and son in the Cessna 150. I think it was the son they said was flying, if I remember right. Mm -hmm. um, but they had only found one of them at this point. Oh. Um, okay. at least as of yesterday or the day before. And I think um, the F-16 pilot was able to, yeah, he ejected to safety, correct? Yes. Yeah. And apparently had some minor injuries mm -hmm. for that. And the, of course, both airplanes were destroyed. And there are several pictures okay. of pieces of the F-16 uh, on the ground and on fire. And uh, not exactly sure what was going on there if they were doing some kind of a low level mission and uh, they ended up, you know, getting mixed up with each other, whatever, mm -hmm. not a good story. Um, so let's move on with some lunacy instead then. <laughs> Would you like to fly? Oops. Would you like to fly in my beautiful balloon? Be quick, float among the stars together, you and I. Oh, we can fly. He can fly on a lawn chair over <laughs> uh, the Calgary Rodeo. Yeah. The Calgary Stampede. That sounds like that a fun time. Stampede. Thank you. Thank you. Every year they have a big giant rodeo thing in beautiful Calgary, uh, Alberta, Canada. And uh, this guy, Daniel Boria, or Boria, decided he owns a, uh, a company, something about um, some kind of a cleaning products, like uh, pure cleaning products company. I don't know. I was watching a video of him, uh, uh, a, um, an interview of him. And it uh, doesn't say in this particular article that I pulled up from CNN. But anyway, he uh, thought it would be a great idea to get attention, which he got, for his cleaning business. Um, and he... You know, he doesn't have any... It would have been better if he had like a banner for his business or something because it's hard to tell. I mean, yeah. if you were just watching this, you wouldn't know what he was drawing attention to himself for. Well, apparently, um, I think, that he was looking into something like that, but then found out that there was like a, um, a prohibited or restricted area around the stampede because they don't want airplanes flying over the top right. of the crowd. And so, you know, he tried to hire a uh, helicopter and light airplane, um, you know, pilots to mm -hmm. take him and fly a banner, or he was even thinking about jumping out of the airplane. Um, and, but they all said, uh, no, we can't do, do that. It's illegal because there's a restricted flying area over this event. And he thought, well, okay, that's not going to stop me. So apparently after watching the movie up, he got this great idea. 
And all my best ideas come from, uh, <laughs> you know, animated feature films. Now there are a lot of great things from that movie. I have to admit it was a good movie and uh, especially love the squirrel squirrel. I can identify with that. And the cone and, of shame. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the old man, I forgot what his name was, you know, tied a bunch of multicolored helium balloons to the house. And then he went on his journey and uh, this guy did very much the same thing. He uh, bought a lawn chair for $19 and 99 cents and 110 helium balloons, the largest that he could find <laughs> uh, for about $13 each. And I think there were about six foot, six feet in diameter or something like that. Filling up the balloons cost around $80 each and took about two hours. I think he said he used like two and a half pallets of helium. Wow. And uh, so it was about $10,000 worth of preparation costs. And then he, he uh, sat himself. Oh, he had an oxygen tank and a parachute. And then he took off. And there is some video of, of this whole event, uh, the launch at least of this guy heading off. And uh, I meant to play that, but I, I didn't uh, get around to getting that video in. And uh, so off he goes. And then he realized that uh, once he was up at, at altitude, that uh, the winds were a lot stronger than he <laughs> anticipated. So he uh, he didn't really prepare, you know, for for this as a uh, flying event or aviation event. You mm -hmm. know, you always want to check your winds aloft and yeah. So apparently, even with like, skydiving. Oh, I need to I need to jump out now because I'm getting way off target and. Uh, so he parachuted to safety. He rolled a, an ankle. He thought he had broken his foot, but uh, he was still able to walk. And uh, he said, a guy was driving by and was going to give me a ride, but instead he <laughs> got a ride in a different kind of vehicle. <laughs> yes. Nice. A police officer arrived and put two and two together and put me in custody. So, yes, God protects children and fools. Yes. Uh, you know, I, I think when I was reading the article, they still have not. But <laughs> uh, they hadn't found the lawn chair yet. Lawn chair yet. <laughs> um, yeah. So sounded like a good idea. Made for some good pictures, but uh, I don't think anybody at the Stampede ever saw this guy. Probably not. Well, I, I mean, it, you know, we were talking about before when it seemed like a good idea to try and hire a small aircraft or a helicopter to draw attention to his business. I don't know what sitting in a lawn chair filled with balloons says about cleaning services, but I wouldn't have made that connection if I actually did see him from the. Oh, come on. You don't automatically see a guy in multicolored helium balloons and you think, hmm. Ooh, cleaning products. Cleaning products. Hmm. That's what I think of. Yeah. I don't I, know. It must just be me. I don't know. Yeah. Well, when you watch this, uh, this interview, you realize that this guy maybe is not completely <laughs> all there, you know? I'm shocked. Yeah, maybe those cleaning products aren't as safe as he thinks they are. <laughs> <laughs> Been around them for too long at this point. Reading too many of those cleaning products. Too fumes. many fumes. <laughs> and uh, finally, uh, yesterday I was busy at work prepping the show. And yes, believe it or not, I do actually <laughs> spend a lot of time preparing the show. I know it doesn't sound like it, but. Uh, and uh, I noticed that uh, was I started to see some a lot of tweets about uh, a problem at United Airlines, again, uh, they had some mm -hmm. computer glitch going on and uh, it led to a ground stop for United Airlines, uh, only affected about 400,000 passengers on Wednesday um, and uh, 4,900 flights worldwide caused big delays in United hubs in Chicago, Denver and Houston. And they said the uh, official word from United was we were recovering from a network connectivity issue this morning and restoring regular flight operations. They said it was a router malfunction, but wouldn't elaborate any more than that. Mm. So uh, this article uh, I was reading uh, from the Washington Post was talking about, uh, yes, reservation systems book your flight, but they also do a great deal more. Airlines use them to track maintenance schedules for pilot and flight attendant scheduling, to create gate assignments and to manage aircraft movement to be sure there are planes at those gates. Um, United's chronic problems with its reservation system are in large measure a consequence of the merger mania, which is merger mania, which <laughs> is the United States with four big airlines that control about 80% of all domestic flights. Now, 
You'll remember that Delta Airlines merged with Northwest, Southwest merged with AirTran, and American merged with U.S. Airways, and United merged with Continental. And almost in every case, um, like Delta and Northwest were, mm-hmm. were using the same system. American and U.S. Airways were both using the same system or a system based on the Sabre platform. But when United and Continental merged, it was apples and oranges on the reservation system. wide. They had two different systems and they decided they would choose one and they chose the one that Continental was using a system called Shares. And uh, they've been working through all kinds of headaches uh, with, you know, Mm -hmm. trying to put all this, you know, all, all the apples and oranges in one basket. And uh, they've been having some, some problems with that. Right. So I know we talk about automation a whole lot, but it's funny how much can't be done these days without computers, you know? I know. And you know, when I was first hired by Acme more than 26 years ago, one of the things that we learned in initial training was how to, do our own weight and balance calculations. I know many of you out there go, what? You don't do them yourself now? No, <laughs> we do <laughs> not. We, it's all done for us by uh, load planning and different departments at the airline. And we are uh, sent via our ACAR system. And then we printed out a uh, weight and uh, balance uh, you know, printout with all the numbers and everything else. So they know exactly how much cargo we have, how many passengers we have, how they're distributed in the airplane, how much fuel, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, then they, uh, they tell us what the weight of the airplane is, the zero fuel weight, how much fuel we have. And then we put in all the numbers for a safe operation. And we had a system back in the day where, you know, we could do all that manually. We had manuals that we, you know, would pull out and, and a, and a piece of a worksheet that we'd fill out and it was possible. And each station actually had somebody qualified to, uh, to be able to do that. But, um, not too long after that, because we began to depend so much on computers that, uh, the people that were trained in doing that were, they no longer knew how to do it. And, uh, they, they, it wasn't their job anymore. Yeah. I mean, we can't even do it. I mean, if we were sitting there, in this situation mm-hmm. and had all the data available to us, we will, it was not, not legal for us ACME pilots to do it manually. Right. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, we, we, I mean, it wasn't even, um, you know, things, at least the way they made it sound on the news when I was watching about the story the other day, they were talking about, they were having trouble even printing. They couldn't print boarding passes, tickets, luggage tags. I mean, yeah. everything. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, automation is a wonderful thing, but when it doesn't work, <laughs> exactly, that's the common thread here, whether it uh, be in the cockpit in, uh, you know, a situation where the automation stops working and pilots don't know what to do, or in this case, you know, the, it stops working and gate agents and everybody else in the airline doesn't know what to do because there really are no backups to, yeah. uh, to there's to, no manual backup system for any, anything anymore. Yeah. Is, I mean, even today at work, my computer in my office decided it was just going to freeze up for about 10 minutes, but I couldn't look up stuff that I needed to do my job. I couldn't look up x-rays and images, and I ended up being a few minutes behind, and I was like, for you know, this stuff all used to be on paper, and now I can't even access it. Like, it's right there. It's in the box. It's in the computer. That's but, this crazy world we live in, right? It is. It really is. Depending on those, on those zeros and ones. <laughs> um, before we go to feedback, I'd like to play a couple little clips in here that I have in my sound clip. I was going to say here, Mike Carroll says load planning can still do manual weight and balance. Oh, that's true. They can, uh, and then they can give us what they call a radio closeout and, uh, and can give us that um, information over the radio. Um, there are, yeah, he's right. There, there are some systems some backups to the system um, that uh, are in place, but not the old, you know, the pilots can't do it with, you know, piece of paper, you know, right. template and, uh, you know, the calculator cost us to do that anymore, yeah. which is probably a good idea actually. <laughs> um, thank you, Mike, dispatcher, Mike kind of, he's got our back, uh, but he's right. There are some, there are a couple alternatives uh, when uh, the system goes down for, for the, uh, for our company at least to, uh, 
to give us some data uh, necessary to do at least our part of our of the job. Um, but uh, let me play uh, this little sound clip that I've been wanting to play for quite some time. It's kind of amusing. At the Opera Yard 4466, when you have some time, we can tell you about our woes. All right. Shoot, sir. Uh, looks like I've broken. We're going to be uh, going back to the gate, and we have a secondary problem. We're going to have to, have to be towed back to the gate in shame. Oh, okay. Um, are you guys coordinating with us, or would you like me to make a quick call? They are coordinating as we speak. Uh, we are unable to move the airplane, so this looks like a good spot. Is that good for you? Hey, you guys are fine. <laughs> You're fine. The, uh, you have two off your right. They're shut down. So uh, you keep me posted. We'll coordinate and get uh, your vehicles over there to tow you back in shame. Okay. Do you want me to stay with you or go on over to ground? Oh, no. Stay with me, sir. All right. I won't judge you. <laughs> <laughs> the Brickyard 4460, we gave off the call anyway, and uh, yeah, they're just finding out about this, so um, hopefully the coordination will happen quickly. Did they give you a, a gate assignment? Uh, uh, um, they gave us, uh, they gave us gate, um, still here? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, good, we just lost power now. Everything is breaking on this thing. Oh, uh, yes, gate 35. Thank you. That was just one of those days for... <laughs> yeah, no, nothing going right. <laughs> At least he kept a good sense of humor about yes. it. And at least it was all, you know, on the ground and right. low stress environment. Uh, Things are going to break. It's best to break on, on the ground. ground in, in shame. Yes. We'll <laughs> anyway. have to be towed back in shame. I thought that was uh, kind of cute. All right. Well, next is the best part of the show. And that, of course, is your feedback. Which is going to come. Oh, okay. I was like, are we doing that? <laughs> Point. No, I think we'll uh, go ahead and um, call it quits for tonight. Let me 